All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this presentation. This will be a, sort of a deep dive into um, patients' experience in the state programs um, and specifically around sort of the, the experience that patients are having in adult use markets. So this is um, one of us a series of um, educational webinars we're doing in the month of August. Uh, next week, we're gonna have a webinar on a consumer's guide to cannabis product safety called What's in Your Cannabis. And then on Thursday, we'll be doing a deep dive into the power of advocacy, which is how we all got here in the first place. So to start off, um, I'm Steph Jerem, the founder of Americans for Safe Access. And our mission is to ensure safe and legal access to cannabis for therapeutic use and research. And specifically what that means for us is that we are creating a world where patients only have to consider their medication in the context of their healthcare journey, not when making basic life decisions. And so that means we're advocating for a regulatory framework that invests in the development of standardized cannabis-based products ensures a safe and consistent supply, Doctor, fosters doctors integrating cannabis into their patients' treatment as a frontline medication, encourages insurance coverage, and prohibits employment, housing, and parental and healthcare discrimination. And so sort of the a context of all of these state programs is the medical use of, of medical cannabis. And so you know, for a lot of people, they think that um, you know this the topic of of cannabis as medicine is either you or yes or no, um, you approve it. They don't really understand uh, the nuances of all the delivery methods, the different cannabinoids, <clears throat> and the fact that um, you know patients are using this often uh, when there are no other options, um, or maybe cannabis is is the safer option. And so in order to really look and see what, what's happening within the, um, the current uh, programs, I'm going to do a, a quick um, dive into the history. And we're going to stop along the, you know, several times during the webinar to answer questions and get feedback. Um, so if you have questions while I'm presenting, just put them in the chat or Q&A, and we will get to everybody's questions. So... Um, the medical cannabis program um, that we see today is actually the result of decades of advocacy. Um, and so the you know what what you're experiencing today is because of the advocacy of patients uh, starting in the 70s. And so specifically, you know, wh why we went to the states um, had a lot to do with a, a patient advocate named Robert Randall, who actually, um, you know, fought a um, and won a medical necessity defense in Washington, D.C. for his use of cannabis and then took that to the federal level and, and created an IND program. Um, but that program was shut down and it didn't evolve into federal access. And so if you want a little bit more history of that, we actually did a, um, a deep dive into cannabis scheduling um, in this webinar series that's that's available on YouTube. Uh, if you really want to deep dive into the, the block of federal access. But then during the um, HIV AIDS epidemic, you had amazing people like Brownie Mary, um, uh, Peter McWilliams, um, that opened, uh, you know, they were either distributing cannabis in hospitals or opened um, some of the first um, compassion and clubs, um, but were targeted by federal um, uh by both federal and state uh, law enforcement. And we started seeing sort of, you know, patients standing up and, you know, and, and saying not guilty in state courts for utilizing cannabis for cancer treatments, for epilepsy, for sickle cell anemia, and for MS. And so basically, you know, the beginning of the state programs was basically, you know, this sort of compassionate use concept um, that began by basically creating criminal exemptions. So the very first laws that passed in the 90s uh, basically meant that a patient, um, if they were arrested, they could show a letter from their doctor in court and have those charges dropped. But there was no protection for the medicine and there wasn't a creation of um, the, the 
distribution programs we see today. And so, you know, starting at 1996 was when the first one of those Compassionate Use Act, you know, um, criminal exemption laws was passed. And, you know, over the last 25 years, we now have seen these programs, you know, are in almost every state, all but two states um, and most of the territories. So, um, you know, this has, has been a long journey to get here. Um, and within these state programs, you know, we went from having criminal exemptions to creating um, very nuanced regulations that include, you know, product safety protocols along the supply chain, um, you know, a chain of command as far as, you know, doctors, you know, writing recommendations for patients, patients getting ID cards, um, and, you know, the process of, of recalls. Um, some states have, have done better than others in mandating these. Um, but over the years, um, you know, just in the same way that the first laws were, um, you know, we're really just looking at criminal exemptions, these laws have evolved. And Americans for Safe Access, um, we have been putting out these state of the states reports, uh, really looking at the various policies and um, that states had in place and grading them. And, you know, our, um, you know, what we've demanded from states and the evolution of these programs has definitely evolved over the years. So we've come a long way from just saying, you know, should a patient be arrested for using medical cannabis to really looking at, you know, how a state can, can ensure access for a patient. And so, you know, there have been, um, in the same way that um, the, the HIV AIDS epidemic, you know, sort of pushed states into looking at, um, compassionate use of cannabis, um, you know, to help uh, uh, those living with HIV and AIDS be able to tolerate their medications and expand it to other uses. Um, the opioid epidemic actually had a huge impact on states and what they allowed patients to use. Um, you know, before 2016, um, most states did not have pain as a qualifying condition um, because they didn't want a lot of pain patients using it, but um, because of the work of Americans for Safe Access and other patient advocacy groups, we were actually able to get pain included in, in all states. Um, and now um, states are, are now, um, all states include, include pain um, that have full medical cannabis programs. Same thing, you know, during the COVID crisis, we were able to, you know, make sure that that access to medical cannabis was considered um, part of the essential businesses. Um, and through that lens, we were able to get delivery added to many states, curbside pickup, um, telemedicine, um, and um, again, make sure that they were able to stay open, not just the dispensaries, but the whole supply chain so that patients didn't run out of medicine. And we also, over the years, have removed uh, federal barriers um, to you know that had had been in the way back in the the day of Robert Randall. And when we started uh, working in D.C. in two thousand two, you know, um, basically there was these theories that um, that cannabis was this scary gateway drug, and that as soon as you started using cannabis, um, even if you were using it medically, you would be using heroin shortly thereafter. Um, we were able to challenge that misinformation and, and actually get the DEA to stop using that information. So that's why you don't hear people talk about the gateway theory anymore. Um, another uh, barrier that we heard often was that we couldn't change our laws in, um, uh, in the US because of our, uh, because the fact that we were a signatory to the UN single treaty on drugs. Um, where cannabis was also scheduled uh, in a way that, that said it had no medical uh, benefits, and we were able to change that in 2020. Um, they are also, you know, we're saying that there is no product safety standard, so there was no way to create access programs. Um, over the years, Americans for Safe Access has, has worked successfully with the American Herbal Products Association and the American Herbal Pharmacopoeia, uh, to create product safety standards. And you know there are um, different levels of, of those being implemented across each of the states. Um, and actually, you know, one of the things we kept hearing when we first started working in DC was that um, this was just a, an experiment in a couple liberal states. And I think we have shown now 
um, with Idaho and Nebraska being the only states that don't have medical cannabis laws. Um, and in fact, um, this is actually Asa Hutchinson, who is the governor of Arkansas, uh, who's actually, um, we named our organization after him because he was head of the DEA when we were founded and we were um, Asa versus Asa. Um, and he now presides over a medical cannabis program. So I think we've we've disproved this sort of myth that this was just a little experiment that was gonna go away. Any questions before I jump into access today? Uh, no questions so far regarding that. We do have a few questions, but I think you're gonna answer them in a minute. So. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so today we have 6 million plus registered uh, medical cannabis patients. Um, and within the state uh, laws, there's over 100 qualifying conditions. Um, we basically, as we said, we see, you know, most states have some type of program. Um, some, you know, obviously, some are better than others. Uh, but within these sort of state by state program, there are a lot of people that are left out. So even if even patients in California, if they're a veteran or a federal employee, um, you know, are, are unable to, to utilize those programs. Uh, and of course, uh, because of the federal prohibition, uh, there are you know, a lot of restrictions that, that patients still face, um, you know, whether it's you know, not being able to take a government job, uh, utilize government assistant programs like HUD housing, um, you know, unable to travel freely, uh, unable to visit national parks with their medicine, um, unable to um, uh, you know, talk to their doctor freely about the medications that they're taking. And of course, you know, all patients are still facing work, workplace housing um, and healthcare discrimination. And so what, you know, what this also means is that within this sort of paradigm, you know, we, we see you know, patients unable to trust the labels on their medications, um, as I mentioned, workplace drug testing, um, patients unable to travel to attend life events um, because of, they can't travel with their medicine. And even if the state has either adult use or um, a, a reciprocity law, the chances that um, that, that state would have their medication uh, is, is a gamble that many patients can't take. Uh, patients are unable to use their medication in hospitals and in hospice. Um, of course, there's the out-of-pocket costs for doctor's appointments and medicine that, that keep medical cannabis out of reach for many people in states with, with adult use or medical cannabis programs. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, there are millions of Americans that are unable um, to utilize government assistance programs or VA services if they choose to use medical cannabis. Uh, the other thing that, that I um, wanted to show you is, is, you know, within these states, you know, just because your state has a medical cannabis law, there's still several barriers to whether or not a patient can actually access that program. And so, you know, within the context of advocating for these state laws, um, you know, the public and often um, elected officials uh, hear from patients some of the roadblocks, right? Um, you know, the, some of them we already talked about, but you know, everything from you, know, you know, does the does the state um, you know have uh, your condition as a qualifying condition? Does your doctor um, or patient or does the patient know that it, that it's an option? Um, you know, can they afford to be a part of the program? Uh, can they afford the ID? Um, and so the reason I wanted to share this with you guys is that all of this, you know, it's a long road um, from a state having a medical cannabis program to a patient uh, having access. Um, and for, you know, here's an example to look at like Michigan um, that has a total population of 10 million. But if you look at sort of all of these barriers, um, you know, there's 5 million that are not, you know, uh, eligible to even be a part of the program. And so I've I think that as we've been sort of putting out this information, um, I think that within the context of adult use, um, that often elected officials and the public think that if you just, well, maybe if you just make it legal for everyone, uh, then you're not gonna see those barriers, that those will go away. And of course we know that some of these barriers can't go away until federal law changes, um, but that just making cannabis legal 
um, isn't enough to, to address the issues facing patients. Um, and so I, I mentioned before, every year we do a, a report looking at the state laws and grading them. Uh, you can download the report from um, 2022 uh, here um, to see sort of, you know, after all of these years, um, you know, there's still not a single state that has received a grade. And so this is sort of all of the criteria that we look at from each state. Um, and this is the sort of the, the state of the states. There's a, a lot of Fs. Um, I think uh, B minus was the, was the highest grade this year. Um, and so even within the context of, of states without adult use trying to serve patients, we still see challenges. Um, and uh, we also um, issued a report um, this year called Regulating Patient Health to show some of the disparities in, in um, the state testing programs. And this is not just in the medical cannabis programs, but in, in all access uh, in both adult use and medical. And so some of the trends we've seen um, in you know, last year um, that I'm sure a lot, of, a lot of you have felt in your state is that the improvements to medical cannabis programs are slowing. And part of that is the, you know, the federal prohibition. Part of that is a switch on focus to adult use programs. Um, you know, again, this perception that adult use is gonna make medical cannabis better. Um, that's sort of the half full way to look at it. The half empty way is that um, people didn't really believe cannabis was medicine in the first place. And so by pushing adult use in, um, they're they're really addressing the the major issue. Um, patients can't depend on the product labels. Um, there's unregulated markets that are super confusing. Um, and again, we're starting to see businesses prior prioritizing adult use consumers. Um, and that you know is mostly just so they can survive that within the context of a um, you know a business plan where they can only provide medicine to people with certain conditions within a state, uh, they've had challenges to be able to keep their doors open. And so as they expand their consumer, their uh, market base to include adult use consumers, um, no matter how well-intentioned those companies are, the reality is, is that their focus on products that they purchase or that they make um, are going to, um, you know, go first to the adult use market rather than, rather than um, serving patients. So I'm going to jump into the the impacts um, of you know prioritizing adult use before medical, which I'm calling you know prioritizing happy hour before patient health. Um, before I jump in here, um, are there any questions, Debbie, or should I just jump into this next part? There are some questions and they're really good, but let's jump into this next part because I can't remember if you answer them or not. <laughs> okay, great, great. And then while I'm while we're going through this section. Um, you know, if you, if, if there's a experience that you're having that I don't mention, please, you know, share that in the comments as well. And so again, you know, we're sort of dealing with this context that everybody thought, well, if we just legalize cannabis for everybody, and this is both, we do, we, we hear this at the federal level, as well as in states that everyone is going, you know, all of the patient problems are, are going to be solved. And so, you know, one glaring one is that adult use programs are designed for, for people that are 21 years and older. And so that excludes any patient that is between the ages of 18 and 21. Um, and so they still have to go into the medical cannabis program. And of course, this does not um, address pediatric patients at all. Um, and again, so if you, if, and, and what we're seeing, you know, states do is, is many of them are actually merging the programs. So, and getting, you know, and moving cannabis regulation out of departments of health and putting it under um, the same regulatory authority as alcohol. And so, you know, these individuals are now um, being overseen by an agency that's focusing on intoxication. And so, you know, these, these individuals, you know, not only are they left out of the adult use program, but now they have regulators that actually um, don't have experience in working with these populations. So we also are seeing, as far as access goes, is that, is that as adult use programs uh, come on, there are still many municipalities that 
um, that are, are showing NIMBYism, right? They don't wanna see adult use uh, retail locations uh, in their communities. And so when you have a, a, a scenario where these programs are merged, that means that, you know, these adult use retail locations aren't, aren't able to open in these communities and there's no one trying to open dispensaries. And so we're starting to see even, especially, you know, California is a great example. Um, there are huge access deserts where, you know, there's no delivery available and patients have to drive uh, a couple hours to get access to medical cannabis. Uh, and for many patients, that's just not an option. Uh, we're also, um, you know, seeing that um, within the sort of programs, um, you know, they're they're not addressing some of the civil protections that patients need. So, for instance, if somebody is using cannabis um, recreationally, uh, you know, there may not be the same protections for housing or for um, um, or for um, uh, for employment. Um, you know, obviously, a patient using their cannabis is not a choice. And so, you know, um, if a state is not looking after uh, those aspects, um, you know, that means that they're, you know, obviously maybe not able to participate in medical cannabis programs at all. Uh, the other items is just, is the taxation um, and whether there's, you know, maybe no sales tax for, for patients, there's still all of these other taxes that they get passed on to the patient. And so, um, you know, patients are already paying out of pocket for uh, their doctor's appointments and now adding on, you know, increased taxes um, or again, trying to compete with um, the adult use consumers is coming straight out of their pocket and their bottom line. Oh, I'm sorry, here's the, the civil protection. So um, because, you know, you know, under medical cannabis laws, we fought for years to get patients use of medical cannabis to be considered, um, you know, a, uh, a right that is protected under, under civil laws, which meant that they had a right to, um, to any other, any other protections that someone with a, a prescription to another medication would have. And so, you know, by moving patients into the adult use market, uh, it makes patients more susceptible to discrimination uh, and punishment for their legal use of, of medical cannabis. I know I think this is where we start seeing, um, you know, a, a huge misunderstanding. And again, I think part of this is that um, it's just misinformation that I think the public and definitely elected officials, when they think about cannabis uh, and definitely in the, the context of prohibition, that, you know, cannabis, um, people just think of it as one thing, right? That maybe you can smoke it and maybe you can eat it, but they don't really understand the nuances um, of medical cannabis. And so, um, you know, due to the, the limited market size of medical cannabis and the fact that, you know, if we did have a, if medical cannabis was legal federally, then you would have, you know, uh, manufacturers who would have a, a market of 6 million patients to produce products for. But when we're um, stuck in the same sort of geofenced um, uh, market, uh, you know, we're seeing, you know, patient products, um, you know, being pushed aside, especially if they're more expensive to produce. We're also, um, you know, competing, you know, like literally with supply. So um, there have been several instances where um, an adult use program come, comes on uh, and the, the 21 and over uh, crowd actually use up all of the cannabis in that market um, and patients are, are left without. The other um, issue again, and I, we kind of mentioned this, is you know the, the varieties of, of cannabis um, that patients want and what we want from this plant can be very different. Um, and you know from a very, um, there's a very large spectrum. So some patients need really high THC products um, that are actually capped out of adult use programs. And on the other side of that, there are patients that need um, products, you know, that aren't that aren't that sexy for adult use users. Um, we also, um, you know, have, have heard from patients this frustration that they, you know, already know what works for them. Um, and they've, you know, become dependent on a, a certain product 
that again, um, they it those products sort of dry up to create shelf space for products that are that are more um, susceptible and more um, more in demand from an adult use market. The other issue that we're seeing is that um, there are are limited amounts for possession uh, for adult use. So, like specifically in Connecticut. Uh, for the adult use recreational market, they can only possess um, 1.5 ounces of cannabis, um, while patients can possess up to five ounces. And so, you know, if you're throwing, um, and again, the context of this is that is that as states are passing these laws, they're saying that they're, you know, they're going to be that both laws are still in place. But the reality is is that the medical program starts to dry up. And patients are finding themselves having to be in, you know, have, having to participate within the adult use market, um, and unable, um, you know, to to have the benefits, however limited they were, from from the medical cannabis program. And I think we, you know, this is a, a major one, which is, you know, patients need to be able to talk about their medication. They need a little bit of assistant to understand the products, to understand um, what might work for them. We know that you know they're not getting this information from medical professionals. It's not like they're getting a prescription and they're just, you know, they've already talked to their doctor about it and they're going to get it filled. Um, you know, they often need somebody to to help them with the decision making. And you know, Within several of the medical cannabis programs, there was actually required training uh, for people working in dispensaries uh, to be able to help patients with that information. Um, and if patients are going into an adult use environment, it's very unlikely that um, that there is someone who is able to help them with that information. Uh, and um, you know, if they're standing in line around adult use consumers. They may not feel comfortable asking questions um, in a way that that may disclose their medical condition. And so I'll stop there for a minute, Debbie. Do we do we have some questions or maybe some other um, uh, other experience that people have had that we that we didn't mention? Um, yeah, we have about yeah a few questions. One um, specifically from someone in Colorado asking if two things. One, if we could help get terpenes on the label there. Um, but also um, changes to help um, get medical only dispensaries. Yeah, I think that what the the challenge um, right now, as far as you know, both um, creating requirements for labeling um, as well as mandates for um, medical only components, is you know, you know, if there is a market there to also um, um, pressure, make pressure for that. So if you have the, um, uh, the business lobby, um, you know, that, that doesn't want to have to pay for additional testing, um, or if there aren't businesses that are willing to fill the role of those medical only, um, licenses, uh, then, you know, we're not going to see state policymakers be moved, um, to, to include those licenses. And so what we've found is that, you know, for instance, in um, in Maryland, uh, they just passed a, an adult use program, um, you know, regulators there, felt like, you know, a way that they were helping patients what was by helping, um, you know, some of the businesses that were already in the medical program stay open by creating a pathway for them also to have adult use customers. And so the the perception is that you know that that the bottom line as far as you know the business side is going to help is going to help patients. Um, and again, I think that there's a, a lot of sort of misinformation about what patients need. Uh, and again, you know, looking at the limitations of medical only businesses, both in these state programs. Um, as, as well as, you know, looking at a national market. Uh, and so I think at this point we, we have to, you know, we would have to create incentives along the supply chain, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, we have some ideas of ways that we might generate more interest at the state level uh, for businesses uh, to, to pressure 
the state government to have a medical only dispensary. Uh, but at this point, you know, the there ha- you know there has to be a viable business model if we're going to see businesses step into the role to fill those licenses. Another question, Debbie? So yeah, this, again, you might answer this soon, but this is such a good question and it's something that you and I talk about often. Um, Can we have some tips for speaking to our friends and colleagues who work in the adult use industry or adult use advocates about these issues? Yeah, so um, I'm actually gonna um, get into into the campaign work, but we actually have... um, presentations and talking points available um, around these issues. Um, but I think that the, um, you know, the the key is to, you know, bring this up in a way that is non-confrontational and, and to say, look, you know, the patients are actually being left out and here is why. And I think that for most, most, of, the, most of the conversations I have around um, this topic, when, you know, someone, has the misconception that patients are better off now that that adult use has passed. Um, it's really because they they just don't have all the information in front of them. And so I think you know um, explaining any of these points, this presentation will be available. Again, I'm going to go into some of the campaign tools that are that are available. Uh, but I think it's key for us to have these conversations as well. So you know when when someone is talking about adult use in a way that is leaving out patients, it's really up to us to speak up and say, well, actually that is, you don't have all the information or actually, you know, that, um, you know, patients can't afford uh, the medication in these adult use components or patients are no longer finding products that they, that they need. But I think that the key to us moving this issue forward uh, is is being a part of the, the education, right? Is being part of um, of correcting misinformation when we hear it, which is not always easy. Uh, but I find, you know, um, I find myself often getting frustrated in the context of this adult use market and that in the conversation of always having to, um, you know, reference, you know, how adult use is going to be affected by policies for patients. Um, and, I think something that's been helpful for me to to sort of take the sting out and and get into a space where I can I can educate instead of um, you know like getting a protest sign and picketing my friends is that you know with again back when we were passing these state laws a lot of the the campaign focus that we were telling state legislators and the public was that we needed these state laws so that patients were not getting arrested and then they would have a safe supply. And we didn't really get into all of the details of the various cannabinoids. You know, maybe we talked a little bit about delivery systems. Um, and so in a lot of people's minds, they see adult use and legalization as just, you know, expanding on the medical cannabis program uh, and, you know, uh, really removing barriers for, for patients as well, um, which, you know, is can be frustrating to hear, but I think that, you know, if you really think about how much people um, spend thinking about medical conditions they don't have, it makes sense that, you know, it's really up to us to fill in those gaps for people. Any other questions? I think we're good to move on. Okay. So, you know, as adult uses come on, you know, we've, we've seen states react in, in various ways. Um, you know, the, um, in the early, one of the earliest campaigns that we saw uh, was in Washington state, uh, which was, uh, you know, a very frustrating example where um, we had been working for years to get a uh, state, cent- you know, centralized distribution program in place. We passed it through the legislature and the governor vetoed it. But in that same year, there was a voter initiative for an adult use program that passed. And so in the next the next year, there was like a regulatory system for adult use, and we were still fighting to get a medical cannabis program in place. And what ended up happening, which was something I had never in my wildest dreams thought would happen, is that we actually had the adult use 
uh, market, the adult use license holders were actually advocating against medical cannabis, um, that they saw medical cannabis patients as their um, competitors, that, you know, those people providing, you know, cannabis to people without taxation was hurting their business. And so, you know, that was really a surprise to us, but it really sort of made us realize that we actually had to um, protect ourselves and advocate not only within states around, um, you know, for medical cannabis, but also advocate to our allies within, um, our perceived allies within the adult use markets. And so, you know, through our state of the states report, through, you know, patient education, we have made this a major issue. And, you know, states have been, some states have been trying, um, you know, to add things. They at least, you know, need a talking point, um, you know, to say that they're going to prioritize patients and adult use, and they're going to utilize the adult use program uh, to improve their, their medical cannabis program. That's happening in some states and other states, like, like I mentioned in Washington and even in Colorado, um, you know, we've seen actually um, uh, states go backwards and actually create more prohibition for the medical cannabis program. But some of these things that, you know, that, that I feel like, you know, state legislators um, and policymakers are, that are trying, trying to help patients have included things like exempting patients from sales tax, um, providing check-in lines and registers that are patient only, uh, providing patient only hours, uh, providing discounts on certain products for patients, uh, providing product priorities for patients. Um, so saying products have to go to the, the um, medical um, uh, programs before the adult use, uh, providing reduced fees for seniors and veteran patients, um, waiving some fees for low-income individuals um, for the ID cards. Um, and you know, some of the programs that we've seen actually work. Um, and those, you know, those are sort of nice sentiments. And we'll get into the reality of those in just a second. Um, but we have been, you know, some states have extended the registration period for patients. They've reduced or eliminated the, the registration fee for patients. Um, they've reduced the registration processing time. Um, and we are seeing, you know, telehealth delivery and curbside pickup. Um, you know, stay in place after COVID. Um, and really those last four are the ones that, that out of all of these items that we're really seeing work for patients. So just to give you an example, um, you know, and this is the most common one, right? Um, that the way that these state programs are gonna help patients, the adult use is that they're gonna exempt them uh, from the taxes. Well, on one hand, I would say, you know, as adult use programs come on, the taxes are even higher than what patients were facing in the medical market. Um, and because of all of the out-of-pocket costs, like the, the you know, going, paying out of pocket um, to, to see a doctor that's out of network or that, you know, that uh, won't take insurance to actually get a recommendation, um, paying for the ID card, um, it actually takes several months and in some cases years for a tax break to actually um, be a benefit for a patient. So you can see in Colorado, um, it would take um, a patient, you know, almost five months to recoup uh, the savings from this tax break. And in, you know, Maine, Connecticut, um, we're talking about almost two years, um, Connecticut a little over two years to recoup those savings. Uh, the reality of the check-in lines and registers for patients is that, you know, and this is a big one, is it forces patients to have to identify themselves. Um, you know, within, uh, there are so many protections for patients, um, you know, within employment and other arenas where you don't have to identify your healthcare information. And if you, you know, are entering a business and have to, and go to a register for patients, um, you know, you're identifying yourself and, and forced to disclose your patient status. Uh, often, you know, there's only one register for patients. And so sometimes that line can be even longer. Um, and so instead of just having it be like a, an option for patients, patients actually can't go in the other lines. And so um, it's sort of counterintuitive. Uh, and 
uh, we've also heard many reports that the registers aren't even open. And so a patient has to go find a manager, find someone to actually open that register. Uh, and so again, the sort of nice thought uh, and the implementation isn't, isn't really helping that much for patients. Um, the patient only hours, um, we're seeing that, that they're usually actually either before or after normal business hours, or maybe during lunch hours. Um, so this means, you know, a patient actually has to, uh, it may be inconvenient, but they also have to plan a lot more about when they can go get their medicine versus, um, the experience of any other patient in the country, um, going to a retail location to pick up their medicine, um, as well as any other, uh, as the adult use users. Uh, and, you know, again, um, dispensaries are not fully staffed at these times, so it can be a long wait. So you would go get there for the patient only hour um, and you end up having to spend your entire lunch break uh, waiting to get medical cannabis. And if, you know, that line is too long for that, that period of time, they shut it down and you'd have to come back after hours. So the reality of discounts on products, like this sounds great, right? We're going to give patients a break on, on products. Uh, as we found is that often the products that are being discounted for patients are, are have either been expired or near expiration date. Um, they're not necessarily the products that patients want. So um, half off something that isn't a, a product that you need as a patient isn't very helpful. Um, so you may have to buy, you know, something that you don't, don't need to get a discount on something you do need. Uh, and, um, you know, sometimes those, um, those discounts are only available on a certain day. And so if you can't make it to the dispensary on that day, then you're, you're, you miss out on that, on that product. Uh, the reality of providing priority products for patients is that, um, you know, we're seeing, as I mentioned before, that adult use space are just not keeping the products that patients want on the shelves. Uh, and so, you know, if something's been discontinued um, and replaced by adult use product, even if the business is saying, I'll sell this to a patient before I sell it to someone else, again, it's, it may not be the product that a patient wants. So I'll stop there and see if there, there are any questions. But I think, you know, again, I want to, I, I want to underline that I feel like these are all things that, that states are, are trying to do um, to help patients. Uh, and they're coming from a good, good space, um, or often from a good space, uh, but they're they're really falling short of creating uh, the the access that patients need. Uh, yeah, we. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, it, uh, question, kind of, which goes along with what we're about to talk about is um, how do we keep patients at the top of mind for lawmakers? Well, I think the, the number one thing is that lawmakers have to hear from patients, um, you know, within the, um, the way things have evolved, you know, there are established uh, lobby groups for cannabis businesses. And, you know, that may be the only um, uh, voice that a lawmaker is hearing about these issues. And, you know, I think it's important to remember that Lawmakers have a lot of issues on their plates, and you know their their role as elected officials is to represent their constituents, not necessarily you know represent every every law in the books. So if they're not hearing from you about these issues, they may not even know that they're an issue. Um, and so that means you know whether it's you know going to events where they're uh, doing town halls or speaking. Uh, whether it's writing letters to the editor, um, setting up meetings to meet with them, uh, you know, you've got to get involved. You can't sit on the set sidelines because as much as um, Americans for Safe Access would like to have, um, you know, the ability to reach out and talk to all of your elected officials, um, the truth is your voice is more impactful on one level, and we definitely do not have the resources at this time to do that. So we have, um, I want to dive into some of the, the approaches that we can look at. So one is we have a, a campaign that we've implemented, the State Medical Cannabis Equity Campaign. Uh, and the goal of this is to, array, is to raise awareness of patients' issues. 
Um, so within our, our campaign section, you can find tools like sample letters to the editor. There are um, um, actually, you can just put in your, um, uh, your zip code in this part of our website. And there's a, a template of, uh, of a letter to your uh, state representatives. Uh, there are um, tools like the, the State of the States report, but we also have a, um, an overview of the, the a major part of this um, campaign, which is the uh, Medical Cannabis uh, Program Equity uh, Checklist. Uh, and we have talking points and, and actual legislative language um, that you can utilize to help with, with these conversations. And so when we've, you know, again, um, at Americans for Safe Access, we are we have been straddling sort of the state and federal um, dichotomy for two decades. And at one level, you know, the state programs were meant to be a triage to get patients off the battlefield of the war on drugs, um, an opportunity for us to rig to figure out some of the regulatory roadblocks um, that would allow us to have a federal program and have a national, um, a national program that that would grant patients federal rights. Uh, at the same time, we realize that access is happening at the state level. And so we do whatever we can to expand and improve those programs. So when we're looking at the adult use and medical cannabis program, we came up with this checklist that also includes, we have uh, legislative language on our website that goes along with each one of these items. So as, if your state already has an adult use program or if um, they're considering one, uh, this checklist is something you can get to uh, elected officials to try to implement or introduce uh, either amendments to the, the pending adult use language or amendments to the existing laws. And so, of course, that means that, you know, we want to see the expansion of uh, eligibility for all conditions. Uh, I think often people think, well, we don't need to worry about the conditions list because if your condition isn't on there, um, then you can just go to the adult use program. And we've We've mentioned all of the people that are that are left out of that, um, whether it's someone between the ages of 18 and 21, um, or someone they can't afford the 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 taxes, or you know the, the whole long list of, of issues. Um, we ask that they actually completely remove the patient fees and allow uh, multi-use uh, registrations. So you know from the tax revenue that's coming in for adult use, that should subsidize any costs of the medical cannabis program. Uh, and this is an important one. We want to see the expansion of access to independent cannabis testing labs. So right now in most of the states, the way the laws are written is the only way that a lab can test a cannabis product is if it comes from a licensed uh, cultivator manufacturer or dispensary. And what we would like to see and encourage is actually ways that patients can bring their products directly to the laboratory to check for that safety. And part of that is that there's, you know, obviously discrepancies in um, and gaps in testing protocols and regulations. Um, <clears throat> but uh, we also want to make sure that that patients have um, another tool in their toolbox, <clears throat> excuse me, to make sure that they, you know, that they're providing and they have access to the safest cannabis uh, for their medical needs. Uh, where we'd like to see states keep medical cannabis and adult use separate at the regulatory level. Uh, we'd love to see medical stay in um, departments of public health and uh, adult use can go over to the alcohol component. Um, this is definitely something we are losing in most states. Um, and it also is sort of pointing us to, you know, if, if states want to regulate cannabis um, as an intoxicant, um, you know, it's really pushing us towards the need for a federal program that will recognize our medicine. Uh, we want to see them remove uh, restrict, restrictive caregiver, caregiver requirements um, and also their, their registration fees. Um, again, just telling us to go to the adult use market is not helpful. And instead of just looking at like, yes, we should pay, you know, no medicine should ever um, be, you have to pay a sales tax. But in order for um, you know, the person from from Colorado that mentioned, you know, how do we get um, you know licenses that are just medical only? Well, we need to see um, 
we actually need to see incentives um, happen along the supply chain. Um, so, you know, everything, you know, there's excise taxes for cultivators, for, for manufacturers and um, increased sales tax um, at the retail level. And if states, you know, removed those for those companies that want to serve patients, I think we'd see a lot more companies wanting to either remain in the medical cannabis market or um, potentially, you know, prioritize um, those products. <clears throat> we want to see the the patient access and the you know inventory is is actually prioritized, and so that doesn't just mean giving us a cash register um, or line, but but actually having an inventory and understanding of um, what products patients need from the market and stepping in and actually, you know, making sure that those are being created in the state. Uh, we want to see um, an expansion and prioritize, prioritization of licensing for medical cannabis businesses. So not just throwing them together, um, but actually, you know, really understanding where there are um, access deserts and the state stepping in and 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 making sure that that uh, there are medical cannabis access points and products across across the states. We want to see you know full reciprocity for out of state patients. Um, you know if if there's adult use um, programs, you know just because somebody is traveling out of state doesn't mean that they you know that the only way that they can get their medicine is by by going to an adult use um, category. And again you know, for um, anyone who is between the ages of 18 and 21, um, you know, those adult use markets don't work for them. And we've heard from um, from several uh, patients that are, you know, um, uh, going to college that actually, you know, like a, some, a patient who is 18, you know, can't go to, to college in Oregon where, you know, think about one of the most cannabis friendly states, they don't allow reciprocity for patients. And there's no way for that, for someone between the ages of 18 and 21 um, to go to a retail location. So, um, you know, we need to see uh, reciprocity allowed for, for all out of state patients. Uh, and I think it's more important than ever that patients should be able to cultivate um, products in their home. If um, there isn't a reliable market for them you know, patients need to be able to uh, either you know, have the ability to provide themselves with with medicine or at least subsidize uh, the medicine that they're getting from these programs. And of course, you know, I feel like the elephant in the room around all of these issues is often um, the federal prohibition. And so I'd also invite you guys to uh, look into our, our other campaign, Safe Access for All campaign, uh, where we are, are advocating for um, a federal medical cannabis program. And so on this part of our website, you'll be able to find the full text of our proposed legislation, some uh, one pagers and even a presentation um, that goes into detail about the program. Uh, but the elements that we would like to see in a federal medical cannabis program would be the creation of a new department under HHS called the Office of Medical Cannabis and Cannabinoid Control. We'd like to see the creation of a new schedule, a schedule six uh, that would be created for cannabis um, that would remove the criminal penalties away from cannabis. Um, and it would be overseen by the Office of Medical Cannabis, not by the, the DEA. This program would co coordinate with the state regulators. So we'd be building on access. So it would make sure there's no interruption in the current, in current access or supply chain, um, but instead create avenues for, um, you know, for businesses that would like to supply patients across the United States, but also um, create guidance for federal agencies and coordination. Uh, and it would foster public-private partnerships for research and, and product development. Um, so within this campaign, as well as the um, medical cannabis equity campaign, you can find legislative toolkits, um, action alerts, and, and outreach toolkits um, to help you with, um, you know, getting more comfortable in your advocacy. Um, and I also would invite you all to, uh, to join us next week, um, in our other, uh, webinars, um, but especially the, the power of advocacy to understand how to take, um, talking points and, um, and legislative toolkits and how to put those to use to be your best advocate. 
Uh, and of course, um, you know, we invite you to join us um, if you're not signed up for our alerts um, or um, I think you have to be a member to be on this, but it, you know, tell your friends and family uh, to join Americans for Safe Access uh, so that we can continue this important work. And Debbie, are there other questions? Uh, no other questions. So if you do have a question, type it in quickly. <laughs> yeah, I think we're, I'm, I'm getting us, uh, I'm like right on time this time. <laughs> yep, it looks like uh, nothing right now. Fantastic. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, you know, please, you know, don't, don't be intimidated by the, the sort of change in conversation. Um, it, it does feel like you're left out. Um, and the, the reality is that patients are being left out of these conversations and sometimes it's intentional. Uh, and sometimes it's just because there isn't a, a patient in the room, um, to, you know, to correct misinformation. And so part of, you know, the, you know, answering a question that, that someone asked before, about tips of talking to you know allies within the adult use market. Something I always say to legislators and um, and allies is, you know, if you're talking about medical cannabis policy and there isn't a patient in the room, stop and get a patient in the room before you finish that conversation, because the nuances of being a medical cannabis patient, you know, people can't assume. Uh, what it's what it's like for a patient. And so if you really do care about patients and you're not just giving lip service um, to wanting to help patients, uh, then before you craft policies in the name of patients, you should at least know one or talk to one. Uh, and I think we spend a lot of time helping patients become their own advocate. Uh, we have a lot of resources besides the ones I just mentioned um, to help with those tools. Uh, but I think, you know, that sometimes we get a little lost in, in all of the, the weeds, so to speak, of, of the details of policy, when really I think, you know, the main thing that we need people to understand is that adult use and medical cannabis are not the same thing, that beyond product safety protocols, um, the regulatory requirements look very different. And if they're crafting policies, uh, that are supposed to help patients, they need to make sure a patient is advised uh, before moving forward. And with that, um, I will leave you today. I hope you guys join us next week. And again, thank you for taking the time to join us today.